The one, the only, Sophia Minnert is joining us next on Locked On Brewers. This is Interrogation Tuesday. We are chatting with the dugout reporter of your Milwaukee Brewers. Up next. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Brewers. I'm Dominic Catronio. Thanks for making us your first listen of the day. Vinny Rutino will be joining us shortly and the aforementioned Sophia Minnert, of course, the dugout reporter for your Milwaukee Brewers on Bally Sports Wisconsin. Uh, she is incredible. It, what you see on TV, it's even better off camera of what how talented she is, how kind she is to everybody she meets, and the team absolutely loves her. And we are so spoiled to have her as our dugout reporter and have her join us here on Locked On Brewers. We talk about her career timeline, and she is a Wisconsinite. She grew up in Madison, eventually attended Marquette, and now she's been working for the Brewers. Uh, this will be season number 10 for her, which is really an incredible number and something to be proud of for sure. We talk about her bilingual background, some of her favorite stories she's been able to tell this past season, and what makes travel and being there in person so vital to her job. So we hope to see her and the rest of the broadcast crews on the road in 2022, whenever that may begin. But she's got a, a lot to say, and it's a really, really insightful conversation. And if you're somebody that's thinking about getting in the industry, this is a great in interview to hear a timeline from somebody that did it you know, the hard way, the right way of just one step at a time, trying to get reps any way that she could as a writer, as a broadcaster, whatever it may be. And Sophia is every bit as talented, as genuine as you see on TV. Like I said earlier, it's it's really fun to talk to her. And, you know, it, it's it's a fun crew to work with between her, B.A., Rock, Jeff, Tim, Vinny, everybody, Craig, Daria. It's I, I can't say enough good things about how fun this crew is to work with. So without further ado, here's Sophia Minner. Sophia Minnert, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's a it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Um, but I'm jumping right into it. Sophia, give us the story. Where are you coming from? How did you end up as an integral part of the best broadcast team of baseball? People want to hear it. Let's hear it. Um, well, I, th I mean, I think like with anyone else, right, it starts with my parents. They've been huge influences on me. And I think both equally responsible um, for how I've been able to do my job, honestly. Uh, my dad, Al, uh, I grew up in Madison, and he was the longtime head football coach at, at the high school that I went to, Edgewood, here in Madison. And, you know, I, I tell people, if you've seen Remember the Titans, that was pretty much my childhood. Like, my brothers and I, we grew up uh, at the field, at practices, at games, every Friday night, you know, we went to everything and my dad allowed us to be really involved. You know, I mean, we were there in the weight room in the summer, we were helping sort equipment. I'd help him run his football camps. Um, so that was really my first introduction to sports. And I think more than that, just being around teams like regularly, right. And a season start to finish and everything that goes with that. And competition. Right. And so I think that was really just my first introduction and, you know, he encouraged us to be a part of it. It was definitely a family thing for us. Like every Friday night, that's what we did. It dictated a lot of our kind of family calendar, so to speak. And then, you know, my mom, Sylvia, she's from Costa Rica. And so we grew up in a bilingual house and she uh, was really disciplined about making sure that my brothers and I were bilingual. Um, my grandparents didn't speak any English, um, and she was the only one of her family to leave Costa Rica and move to the U.S. Um, so I was the first grandchild on that side of the family. And so it was really important that we spoke Spanish and we spent a lot of time in Costa Rica growing up. So I think, you know, those two things together um, gave me great perspective, um, gave me kind of a really good foundation to do what I do now. Um, I had no idea as a kid that I would be working in major league baseball. I definitely wanted to work in sports. Um, and I think if anyone knew me growing up, they're probably surprised that I ended up in baseball and not football. But, um, I think, you know, the bilingual piece is obviously such a huge element in major league baseball. And, um, that's kind of where it all started for me. 
It's fantastic because you mentioned the bilingual and as somebody who speaks very ugly Spanish, uh, it's very <laughs> refreshing to hear somebody do it professionally. There's a moment I've told you this story and for listeners I want to tell this story too is that the first time I watched a Brewers bro broadcast was Freddie Peralta's debut, like start to finish because yeah. I had seen mm -hmm. Freddie in the minor leagues in the Carolina League and I thought he was a stud. I got to meet him a couple times, really mm -hmm. good kid. And lo and behold, it's you in Colorado talking to his mom, live translating in Spanish. And I look to my dad. I'm sitting in Arizona at the time. And I'm like, okay, the Brewers dugout reporter is, you know, Wisconsin blonde and speaks Spanish. And I'm half Mexican and speak very muy feo Espanol. So for folks who... There's no such thing as bad Spanish, Tom. It's not <laughs> ugly, right? I mean, it's this beautiful language. It can't be ugly. But I just want to say, I mean, how many doors truly has Spanish opened because mm -hmm. now you truly can talk to the entire clubhouse. Yeah, it's it's huge, right? I mean, it's such a big part of, I mean, not just the Brewers roster, right? You I mean, you look at the roster, we have Venezuelans, we have Dominicans, um, Mexicans, right? With Luis Arias, um, Puerto Ricans in the system as well. So, you know, at one point, Mauricio Dubon was in the organization. He was the first player to make it to the big leagues from Honduras. Um, so, you know, we know, right, like the fabric of baseball is so much intertwined with Latin America, the culture, the players, right? It's such a huge piece of, of what the league is and how the game is played today. Um, and so I think you're right. I think it's moments like that, you know, Freddie Peralta's debut. And I think more than anything, it's it's the everyday interaction, right? I, I spend a lot of time trying to talk to the players about stuff off the field as well, right? Their families, uh, what's going on at home. And I think that piece is really important, you know, to, to get to know them. Um, and, you know, my feeling about it has been that these players are critiqued all day, every day, internally, externally, on social media, what we're doing even, right? Um, doing the broadcast every night. And so the last thing I want them to feel is that they're uncomfortable doing another part of their job, right? Which is interacting with the media. And, and I think we want the fans to feel like they know Freddie Peralta, they know these players and they know their backgrounds. And I want them to feel comfortable to express themselves however they want and to be honest. And so we can get to know them. And so I really appreciate um, when any of the Latin players make an effort to do their interviews in English. I know that they all have varying levels of confidence in it. Um, you know, how comfortable they feel speaking in front of a camera in a language that isn't their first language. And so I give them an um, enormous amount of credit um, when they put themselves out there like that and, and do that part of the job with us um, so we can get to know them and their stories a little bit better. So the way I see it is like anything I can do to help facilitate that and help them feel more comfortable, um, I'm absolutely will willing to do it. And, and I, honestly, that's the outcome for me, right? I just want them to feel comfortable so that we can get to know them better and so that they feel like they can express themselves how they want. It's such a, a big thing. I think people need to imagine dropping themselves in Japan and trying mm -hmm. to speak Japanese to the Japanese media when it's not competent. It's a huge, huge thing, and I just have so much respect for that and every reporter that is able to speak to somebody in their native tongue. It's it's such a beautiful thing, and it helps the stories come out. Speaking of stories, you know, the second half of the season, we got to see you back on the road a little bit last year. And, you mm -hmm. know, we don't know what 2022 holds entirely, but it looks like a lot more traveling is going to be coming. How important really is it, you know, for you to be sitting in the dugout well, the stuff that you are mm -hmm. able to collect and relay to the fans sitting at home on Valley Sports Wisconsin, how important truly is it for you to be in that dugout well? Yeah, look, we'd love for things to get more back to normal. Um, I do think we took like some big steps forward last year. Like you said, I think just for everyone in the media, having that field access again, right? Even though we weren't allowed um, as, as a media group back into the clubhouse, I think just being able to be on the field, right? And being able to talk to players on the dugout as they're coming off the field, watching BP, uh, being able to talk to the coaches again, that was something that we didn't have at all in 2020, right? No in-person interaction. And so I think for all of us, whether you were doing play-by-play, -play, you were the analyst, the reporter, I think the writers, right? We all felt that. Um, and also that's what makes the job fun, right? Is, is the people and those interactions and and getting to know these, these guys and, and telling their stories. So I think having that back, um, 
is huge. It's, it's a really integral part of our storytelling, but you know, the access that we have, um, I think just it starts with being present. Right. So I think the players on the staff, they're used to seeing you every day. I think they trust you. You're more familiar, um, being able to check in with them regularly, like, Hey, Freddie, um, I know you're working on your slider, right. Going back to spring training. How's that process coming along? Right. Or injuries as well. Right. Being able to talk to a player if he's rehabbing an injury or something that's day to day. Um, or even, you know, you see a guy going out for early work, right. With a, with a hitting coach, um, extra bullpens. I just, you know, it's just like, there's so many layers to it. I think of the personal side of the relationship and then obviously what's happening on the field with these guys and, and how much they're working on their respective crafts. So it's a huge part. And then I think in game, you know, if there's injuries coming up or I can ask a coach, Hey, what's going on here? What happened with this decision? Sometimes you're able to get little pieces of information that can provide context and, and help out the guys in the booth as well. Going to hop in real quick to tell you about our friends at Built Bar, the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, and it's made even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your New Year's resolution as we are now in February, guys. It doesn't feel like it, but if you're still hanging on to those New Year's resolutions, keep it up with Built Bar. It's actually a protein bar you'll want to eat. It doesn't taste waxy or like a chemical spill like some of those other ones, and the flavors are amazing. Peanut butter brownie. Cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, coconut almond, the list goes on. Their entire lineup is available at Built.com. But how about the actual numbers, right? 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Whereas, you know, a, another candy bar is going to have double the calories almost and 30 grams of sugar. And you get some, a sweet treat here with Built Bar. And you got a promo code that you can use thanks to Locked On. Just go to Built.com, B-U-I-L-T.com, and use the promo code Locked. 15. That's locked 15, and you're going to get 15% off your order at built.com. Locked on Brewers is also brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever increasing number of makes and models coming to you, your vehicles that you drive at home, it's almost impossible for your local chains to stock all the parts you, you need. So, why endure the pointless, you know, counter interactions with, oh, I don't think we have that part in stock, we can order it, when you can just go to rockauto.com. You can save time and money while using Rock Auto as well. It's a family business serving the do it yourselfers for over 20 years. They have everything you could ever need, of course brake parts, tail lamps, uh, motor oil, and even new carpets for your car as well. You can explore their easy-to-use website today, and you can find the solution for your auto part needs. You go to rockauto.com right now, and you can see all the parts available for your car or truck. And in the final, uh, when you're checking out, write Locked On in there, How Did You Hear About Us? So you know that Vinny, Vinny and I sent you, okay? It's an amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, Rock Auto. And don't and Sophia, we can't forget about the Gatorade showers after the game after a walk off, <laughs> right? Obviously, on the road, there's not going to be a walk up, but you're going to get sprayed yeah. by some Gatorade. Um, so that's got to be a plus as well, right? You see that as a plus. The of Gatorade. Course. I like listen. I'm I'm always a fan of like a wins, and then like in a walk off, that means something pretty great has happened to to help the team win the game. So I'm all about like celebrating those moments, right? Because you guys know it, it's it's a long season. Um, it's hard to win these games. And so when you're able to do it in any kind of walk-off fashion, even if it's a walk-off walk, um, you know, we, I think we all know the, the wins all count the same um, and they all matter at the end, right? Like, I don't think you need to tell Brewers fans um, how stressful September can be as you're getting yeah. to the end and you're trying to lock up those postseason spots. So I'm all about, I'm all about celebrating those moments. And as long as it's about the player and not me, you know, getting caught up in it, it's, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, and I, I did want to change gears back to kind of your, you know, you said that your dad was the legendary football coach and my, my college roommate at UW lacrosse, a little shout out to Mike Smith. I know he's a long time <laughs> listener of the show. I know his <laughs> wife is Marcy as well, but um, so he said he played for your dad in that Shrine Bowl. But so the oh, football yeah. piece is your background. Where does the love of baseball come in at this point, right? I mean, you obviously love the game. You're extremely knowledgeable about the game and about players, but where does that come from? Um, so I'm going to put my dad um, out there a little bit. He actually, he and his family grew up Cardinals fans. So that's oh. been, that's been a, con I, yeah, I know. So that's been <laughs> a conversion. Um, that's been a conversion, but they've all, nice. they've all come around, um, fortunately. Um, but you know, like, like any kid, um, 
growing up, you know, even though my dad was a Cardinals fan and, and we would go to those games and, you know, he would take us to Wrigley. He'd take us to Bush stadium. Like more than anything, we also went to games at County stadium. Right. And I think it's like a, a rite of passage for, for any kid growing up here, right. Going to games at County stadium, sometimes in your snow pants, right. In those April games when it was so cold and windy at County stadium. And, you know, obviously now we don't have that problem with American family field. Um, Fortunately, we've got a roof. I think that's far and away the best feature of yeah, our, of, of that agree. ballpark um, that we don't have to worry about the weather anymore. But yeah, going going to games at County Stadium, um, listening to Bob Uecker like everyone did um, yeah. in the summer, you know, when when games were on and listening to his broadcast. But it honestly wasn't really until I was a senior at Marquette. Um, I was interning at WISN, which is the ABC affiliate in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And I was there my whole senior year and, and it was 2008. And so it was a really fun year, um, you know, to be at the time Miller park. Right. And, and I was an intern helping with that coverage and, and I was on the field, you know, when they, when they finally won and got in and I was helping, you know, get sound for, for that coverage. And I think it was really then during that season that, you know, it was really the first time that the Brewers, you know, they broke the postseason drought and they were relevant. People were excited about the team again. And I think that was probably the first time I like really kind of bought in as a baseball fan, so to speak, on like more than just a casual basis of going to a game and tailgating and having a good time. So yeah. um, I think I, I look back on that 2008 season and, you know, just being around the game more. It's, it's, that's awesome. It's crazy because, We've seen so much Brewer history really contained in the last mm -hmm. five years. And you, as you explained, grew up with it truly as a Wisconsin native. How, I mean, is it, it you could say, oh, I cover the Packers or cover the Badgers, but covering your hometown team is such yeah. a rare, you know, it, it, I think yeah. people don't realize how rare it is for somebody from Wisconsin to be reporting, who went to Marquette, who grew up in Madison, to be reporting on the Brewers. You can have a familiar face in the stands every single day. How how crazy is that for your path? It's totally crazy, um, and I think you're you're absolutely right that I couldn't have designed this even if I wanted to. Right, I. I was very fortunate that this is how, you know, the timing worked out for me. Um, you know, I, I did graduate from Marquette and I spent almost three years um, working out of Madison doing like high school sports and WIAC division three college sports. Um, and all of that was airing on Fox Sports Wisconsin. So then I had an opportunity to start doing the social media work um, for both the Brewers and the Bucks. And that's where it started for me, you know, back in, in 2013. And I was really clear that like, I wanted to do more, right. I, I wanted to do feature reporting. I wanted, I was asking at that time for fill in opportunities to be a sideline reporter. And, you know, I kept, kind of just kept pushing for more. And I think just having the opportunity to work here has been incredible. And, and now I don't take for granted how long I've been able to be here. Um, you know, coming up, this will be my 10th season with the Brewers, which, sounds crazy to me. You know, we love nice round numbers in baseball. Um, and so 10, 10 for, to me is a big number. Um, it's crazy that I've been with, you know, been able to be a part of this, a small part of this, um, for that long. And, and like you said, we've seen so much happen in the last five years with this organization that it's just been really fun to watch and to watch the fan base, you know, how excited they are about the success these last couple of years and, I definitely don't take it for granted. Um, the fact that I've been able to be here this long. And to follow up on so, that real quick, oh, go that ahead. I think I know the answer to this, but in 2021, <laughs> do you have a favorite memory or favorite game that your interview, oh. whatever may have happened? Oh God. I mean, that is a hard one. Um, I, I'm going to say the, the one that will stand out to me forever, and it, it won't be just from last year, I think honestly, just in the context of what I've been able to do so far, was Vogie's Grand Slam mm -hmm. against the Cardinals. And I say that because it was like the moment that every kid dreams of, right? Like it's that situation that you play out in your backyard, right? Of like game on the line, bases loaded, pinch hit stadium going crazy, a division rival, a meaningful game. 
And for him to deliver in that moment, you know, knowing kind of all the different roles that Bogey had gone through in that season. And more than anything, what I will remember about that moment wasn't just like the Grand Slam and winning the game, which was a huge win for them at the time. But it was what happened after of like we did the walk off interview and I turn around and the entire team and the coaching staff is in the dugout waiting for him to celebrate that moment. And I've never seen that happen, like Hmm. ever in any win, in any game. And honestly, I can't even think of it happening like across the league. I'm It's probably happened. I can't come up with any other examples right now. But in my time covering the team, I'd never seen that before. And to me, it was just one of those moments that honestly just gave me chills. And like, I teared up because I'm a big softy for moments like that. And I think more than anything, it just showed like how connected the team was and to see them, right, celebrate that moment with Bogey. And it was just, it was one of those moments that you're like, wow, that was really special. Yeah, they seem to really, especially since Council's been the manager, they seem to really have a group that's always been gelled together like mm-hmm. that and really pulling for each other. So that, yeah, that was uh, that was such a special moment for everybody, even fans, right? Totally. Um, yeah. But so 10th season next year, you said, is it? So yeah, we're going to lobby for a bobblehead because I have my Bob <laughs> Euchre 51st season. So we're going to lobby for a <laughs> Sophia Minter 10th season bobblehead. I'm, I'm pushing for that. But, um, I'll bring that to the power. I'm, sure, so. I'm sure there are better candidates for a bobblehead. I'm not sure this is the milestone we need to be celebrating. <laughs> but, but, so, Sophia, I got to I got to come back to. So Taylor Green and I, a good friend of mine, I know he's mm-hmm. a, a scout that's that's very high up in the within the Brewers front office. And he's he's one of the most knowledgeable baseball people that I ever come across. He and I talk baseball all the time, but. Look, he and I talk about how you should be a scout. You could be a scout with your feel for players in the game. It's pretty tremendous. And um, where, like, how do you, how do you, so there's a lot of people that have been, that baseball has been part of their life for their entire lives, right? Their entire adult mm-hmm. lives. And they don't have as much feel for the game as you do. I'm serious with players. So where, you know, where does that come from? Is it just, you know, tell it, tell me where does that come from? Because not everybody has that. Well, first of all, it's really kind of you and um, Taylor to say that. Um, You're the that, next Kim Ng, right? You're going to no, be a mean, GM, yeah. <laughs> that means a lot coming from you guys. It really does. Um, I honestly, I I don't know. I, I, I do think, honestly, part of it, and I realize this is a totally different context, right? But, like, I think just having been around teams and locker rooms and my dad coaching and my brothers playing sports, and, I, you know, I play it a little bit too, but I think just being in that environment for as long as I was to me, that was very normal, you know? And so I just got very used to that environment and I sort of understood, you know, I, even with my dad, right? Like I knew when to ask questions and when not to ask questions, right? Like tough games, good games, um, you know, the ups and downs of a season, everything you're what's going on off the field. Um, I think I just saw a lot of that and Again, I, I do think that sort of gave me context for everything. Now, obviously, that's a very different atmosphere than what a Major League Baseball clubhouse dugout, et cetera, a long season is like at, at the professional level. Um, but I do think it gave me good context to be around athletes, to be around coaches, to kind of know when to ask questions, right, or know when to back off. Um, and I yeah. think also just being around the game, like, I've been very fortunate. Like I've, you know, in my time I, I had Ron Renneke as the first manager and, and now Craig council for the last couple of years. I, I don't think you could ask for two better baseball men <laughs> to, to, to work with and to learn from and to ask questions. And, and I've had a lot of help along the way too, right? Like I've had people like Brian Anderson and Bill Schroeder and Bob Euchre and, and, and coaches who have answered all of my questions and managers who have answered all of my questions. And I think just being around it every day, you absorb more, you ask a lot of questions. I read a lot. You know, I really try to like be prepared and, and know as much as I can. So I think kind of all of that together um, is, is what you're talking about. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that, that means a lot for you to say that. Um, that's really nice of you to say that, but I just, I don't know. I also just try to treat everyone like, like people, (laughs) you know, I think, 
I think fans forget that, but as for as talented as these players are, um, they have personal lives and they're people too, and they've got stuff going on. So I try to, you know, treat them like that too. Hey, y'all, Dom jumping in real quick to tell you about Bet Online. There might be less football being played, but BetOnline.net has way more stuff for you to bet on this playoff season, from scores to totals to player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. Bet Online is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net has basketball, hockey, boxing, UFC odds, coverage, and it's the best in the business, from sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games as well. BetOnline is your number one wagering destination, the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. BetOnline, where the game starts. That's cool. Very cool. And you mentioned the baseball men that you get to deal with, but switching Mm -hmm. over, being a woman in baseball is incredible in its own right. And now we're seeing more and more women move into professional sports and calling men's games. I mean, obviously here in Milwaukee, we have Lisa Byington and Zora Stevenson doing amazing work yeah. with the Bucks in baseball, Jenny Cavanaugh with the Rockies, uh, what Julia Morales has done down in Houston, Emily Jones in Texas, the list goes on of just a, a tiny sliver, Melanie Newman in Baltimore as well. Mm-hmm. How is it working with all these amazing women in baseball and seeing, you know, y'all grow finally as it should in, in this, you know, old tide, old, you know, stuck up you know thought that oh only men can call baseball that's truly not the case how has it been growing with these women totally totally not the case um and yeah you're right i love it and i love that so many of the people that you mentioned are are good friends of mine and i love to see them get more opportunities and like my thing is i love 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 to see women be the first right um i mean i think back to like Susie Waldman, right? Like it just, there's some, there's been some incredible women that have, you know, been the first, right. And, and now done this for a long time. And I think you're seeing more women get to be the first now in new categories. And I love that. And I think that should be celebrated, but my hope is like, we can get to a point where we're not celebrating the first, right? Like we can, it's becoming more normalized. And I think I think the league has taken great steps in that, but I also think, I hope the audience is ready for that too. Um, you know, the more that we're seeing women like Jenny and, and Julia, like you said, and Melanie, um, you know, the league, uh, last season had the first all female broadcast right on MLB network. And we saw that happen a couple of times, allowing women to be the lead voice. Like you said, is okay. I think we've proven like, you don't need to have played major league baseball to be that lead voice. Um, obviously nothing can can replicate that experience, right? Like I can't pretend to have the experience that Vinny does, right? Of, of having been a player. I don't, I can't relate to that, but I can study and ask questions and I can, um, you know, have hopefully answers to questions and, and I can be prepared to have that conversation. So I, I love, love, love to see women get more opportunities. I think it's important for fans to see that, um, you know, you hope that, that allows other people to like, okay, if like, if you see it right, then, then it, it becomes more normal. And maybe there's other women that want to follow in that. And, and I think it's important to see that not just in the media, um, like what we've seen, but with Kim Ng becoming a general manager, you're seeing now, um, you know, the things the Yankees hired, um, a triple a manager, um, first, yeah. first female. Yeah. And so, you know, you're seeing the Brewers had Sarah Goodrum, um, who just left for the Houston Astros. So if someone like Teresa Lau, who is the first female that the Brewers have had on their training staff, I think just seeing women in all of these roles, um, not just in the media, is is really important. Yeah, the Brewers just hired an area scout. Um, mm-hmm. I forget her name. <clears throat> I think she's the Midwest area scout now. But Yeah, Ginger Polson. Is that what her? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Super cool stuff. Now, I I agree. As a, as a father of three little girls, maybe I'll have <laughs> three little girls managing baseball club someday. But um, so I do have one more question. So what do you I mean, this is a Brewers team that obviously has a window to win the World Series. I mean, in your in your 10 years, mm-hmm. you actually have been spoiled, Sophia, to be part of this <laughs> broadcast team when they've been really, really good. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so where do you rank this ball club and do you see them winning a world series in the next couple of years? I hope so. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I think that's why fans and, and I think even everyone internally was 
it was true disappointment, right? With, with how the NLDS ended, because I think it just felt like for as much success as they had and winning the division title, I think people really felt they had a legitimate chance, right? To get back to the NLCS. And if you can get through that and, and get a chance at the world series, I think just getting there, you, that's all you can ask for, right? Is to, is to have a chance. And I think with this team, especially with the pitching staff that they have, right? With, with Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff and Freddie Peralta and Adrian Hauser. And then what you've got on the back end um, in the bullpen, I just feel like they have legitimate pieces there that, that can get the job done. And I think that's why fans were so disappointed, right? Because you feel like they're so close. They have the pieces, they have the talent, you know, they were relatively healthy, you know, going into the NLGS and it just, it just didn't happen. Right. I think we all know how hard it is to win these series um, after a really long regular season. So I, I do think like they've got the core to do it. And, you know, David Stearns and Matt Arnold and the front office, they are excellent at finding those complementary pieces. They're excellent at finding it in unexpected places. Um, they have an excellent track record of, of decision-making when it comes to putting these rosters together. And so I think even though sometimes we're surprised, right, in season, I mean, you think back to what our reaction was to when they traded Orlando Arcia, right? And then it was just a couple of weeks later, they made yeah. the Willie Adamas trade. At the time, those moves were really surprising, right? And then you look right. at the end of the year and you're like, wow, like where, where would this team be without all these moves? You know, I think um, – I mean, I have the utmost confidence in them and, and the organization with Craig Council and the manager seat, right? Like they've got it all. They've got all the pieces. And, um, you know, it's just a matter. There is, so it's so hard, right? Like the formula Craig Council uses that soup analogy, right? Of you, you think you've got the recipe, you think you're using all the same ingredients and then the soup just never comes out tasting the same. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the story of every season. And so, you know, this year, uh, whenever we get there, it's it's going to be up to them to put it all together again. Well, with soup, it's always better the day after, right? So maybe that, that's a sign <laughs> yes. that 2022 <laughs> is the year, perhaps. That That's how I'm maybe, thinking. Yeah, maybe, maybe we got the recipe a little closer, right? So now 2022, we're going to add a little bit more and and hopefully, hopefully it'll all come together this year. So the point is, I'm going to mark this conversation so that when we're talking in October <laughs> about raising the commissioner's trophy, we can credit this conversation during a lockout that this is what happened and how we predicted the Brewers winning the World Series. You heard it here first. It all comes back to soup. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Hey, you know you got a huge Marquette week ahead as well. Uh, I know. Villanova on Wednesday night, so should be huge. I know you're probably going to be at the game. Is that where folks can find you oh, these yes. days? Oh, yes, yes, yes. 9 p.m. I can't believe it's a 9 p.m. tip-off, but you, I yeah. will be there. <laughs> Just last week, I had to do the Bucks knicks at 9 p.m. I'm with you there. I totally understand these late-night tips. But, Sophia, thank yeah. you so, so much <laughs> for joining us here on Locked On Brewers. And for folks who don't know your social media handles, can you let them know, reminder, how they can follow you and throughout the season? Yeah, of course. Um, on Twitter, it's pretty easy at Sophia Minert. Uh, same thing for Instagram. Um, those are the two that I use the most. I'm not on Facebook. So um, yeah, Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have a lot of news and action and stuff coming up once the lockout ends and we can start spring training. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll fire up a lot more content soon. Yes, absolutely. Well, we'll see you in Phoenix and thanks so much for joining us, Sophia. Thanks, All right. Sophia. Thanks guys. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.